<laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, what if you like the facts? I mean, as alternatively presented. So I'm, I'm good with that. So I appreciate that. Um, thank you all for coming out for the first uh, seminar. I know it's uh, sometimes rough getting started, but it's good to see you here. What I wanted to do was sort of start out. Um, I'm not going to talk about the entire periodic table, but I wanted you to realize that um, uh, this is a talk that's mo modified somewhat from one I gave to the American Chemical Society that has the acronym ACS, and I know the Moss Landing um, community was very happy to hear that we had an ACS uh, convention here um, just last fall until they found out that it was not the American Cetacean Society. <laughs> so um, anyway, ACS was uh, uh, receptive, but they're not used to thinking outside their lab so much, so it was really uh, unusual. Um, um, but in light of that, I went back to the ACS publication to see what they had to say about sort of the chemistry. And what they had to say about that was uh, the ocean is to a child as the periodic table is to a chemist. And I thought, well, that kind of, that's kind of grandiose. I thought maybe for me it's more like the biogem biogeochemist sees the periodic table in the ocean. You know, when I look out the window, I see that. Um, but I also see the ocean in the periodic table. So I, I just wanted to sort of cast a different sort of light on this and, and also relate the fact that the Moss Landing Marine Laboratories has had a fundamental role in developing our understanding of many of these elements on this periodic ta table as in terms of ocean processes. And so in these letters represent, oh, here we go, um, the um, elements that uh, right off the top of my head were ones that have been studied by Moss Landing students, faculty, um, over the last few years. And actually, um, the element I'm going to talk about um, today, uh, mercury, was first studied by Moss Landing scientists in 1972 when um, John Martin, George Nauer, published a paper on the pelagic distribution of mercury species in fish. Um, and so they were really at the forefront to, in terms of uh, determining the bio, uh, biogeochemical and um, bioaccumulation of that species in higher trophic levels. So, th you know, this is quite a, this is, you know, a third to the half of the periodic table. Mercury is the one I'm going to be talking about today. But um, this has really lent a lot to our understanding, not just of uh, the chemical distributions, but also of ocean processes. So I want to keep you that, keep, want you to keep that in mind. So every one of these elements tells a story. And here's the story I'm going to tell. Every one of these elements is sort of part of a unique um, narrative. The compounds uh, constructed from these, uh, these uh, chemical species also tell their, uh, their own story. And today I'm going to focus on one, um, uh, mercury. And um, yeah, in fact, during the, during the reunion, there was a, we had a small group of chemical oceanographers kind of all huddled together, and like 75% of them were working on mercury. It was kind of weird to see. And the first student to work on, on mercury, um, who was Andrea Perdue, a student of John Martin's, and looking at mercury and sablefish, was there as well. And so she self-identified as a, as a chemist, as a, and so that was, that was pretty exciting. Um, so I'm going to give you a little a tour through this element and then talk about it, its sort of global contamination. And then I'm going to talk about um, how Moss Landing Marine Labs has jumped into the study of mercury cycling in the oceans. So mercury is um, it's really a fickle element. Um, it's, um, it's got a huge atomic weight uh, and a density of 13.6. This means you can float lead in mercury. I don't know. Has any, have any of you, like, as a kid, probably, because played with mercury and kind of felt it, and it's, uh, it's, so, it's such an unusual element. I remember my father gave me a, a pound of mercury in a glass jar this big. It held two tablespoons. It was a pound. And I floated dimes, and I probably contaminated the hell out of myself. But uh, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's really a unique. It's one of the only elements that's a liquid at um, sort of uh, surface planetary conditions. Um, 0.5 ppm of the Earth's crust is mercury. It makes it relatively a, a trace element, uh, more scarce than uranium. And the other thing about it from an oceanographic perspective is it exists in many chemical species. So mercury zero is, of course, the um, um, elemental or liquid form that you know of. The dominant form of mercury in the oceans is the plus two cation, typically complexed with uh, 
uh, chlorine. Uh, but then there's these organic forms, di uh, monomethylmercury um, and dimethylmercury, both of which are potent neurotoxins. So it's good, it's bad, it's an ion, it's a liquid, you know, it's a gas. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's really a great element to, uh, to be looking at. Um, the other thing about it, and we're going to get back to this, is it's got a pretty low melting point and a really low boiling point. It boils at the temperature of your pizza oven. If you've got a wood-fired pizza oven, you're volatilizing all, um, all the mercury um, in your pizza, which is just a good thing. Um, but we're going get, to get back to that, uh, the, that particular property because it's important in terms of mobilization of mercury globally. Um, it readily forms intermetallic co compounds with other metals, so it means like other metals like to dissolve in mercury. Silver likes to dissolve in a platinum, gold. Um, and so that's a, that's a property that has uh, enabled placer gold mining that we're going to talk about, but also how many of you have mercury amalgam or silver amalgam uh, fillings in your head? One. Two, three, four, okay, all the old guys, right? <laughs> yeah, me too. Or they're coming out one by one. <clears throat> um, unless you eat three helpings of fish uh, a week, those mercury amalgam fillings are your largest dose of mercury to your body. Um, okay, and it acts as a cumulative poison. You can see that the, both the methyl and the dimethyl are sort of um, lipid soluble or the um, Monomethyl in particular is lipid soluble. Um, dimethyl mercury is a gas, but it's uh, it's bioaccumulated, um, and uh, it's uh, uh, that is its concentration increases with every step of the trophic food chain. We're going to talk about that too, about a factor of ten. So it's got amazing historical uses. It found uh, quite a long time ago, and uh, Chinese and Egyptians were using it for pigments. Um, uh, alchemists thought it was mystical. Um, it was used as a medicine. Actually, still, uh, uh, mercuric chloride is used to treat some topical skin conditions, um, mostly infections. Um, and it was in the 15th to 20th century, it was used as a medicinal cure for syphilis. So it's got all these wacky properties. And, and so um, Woodall, in 1672, said it is the hottest, the coolest, a true healer, a wicked murderer, a precious medicine, and a deadly poison, a friend that can flatter and lie. I love that description of this element, you know? It's, uh, it it kind of gets you. You're probably familiar with mercury in the mineral forms. This is mercury in the elemental, HG0, in the upper left. And then, um, and then this is an example of a rock in the upper right that, um, that has actually elemental mercury in it, um, uh, those little drops. That's a rare form to see it in nature, but you can see it that way. Uh, mo more often, you see it in the form of cinnabar, um, or mercury sulfide complexes, <coughs> and those are the more common for us. Um, they're found uh, in forms that are familiar to you in dental amalgams, uh, thermometers, and I've been advocating for a mercury thermometer buyback program in this lab. That mercury in that thermometer is enough to contaminate, well, double the concentration of mercury in a cubic kilometer of seawater. Okay, that's quite, uh, so it gives you an example of how um, busting a thermometer in this laboratory would completely put us out of business. Um, as would, um, well, here's another example. Um, it's also used in mercury vapor lamps and fluorescent fixtures. There's about 0.3 uh, milligrams of mercury in every uh, fluorescent, four foot fluorescent tube. So that's, uh, that's a, big, that's a big problem for us, but it is, um, it's handy um, because uh, um, mercury's got such a strong emission wavelength in the ultraviolet that uh, there's a very efficient conversion of electrical energy into photon energy. And the insides of those uh, fluorescent tubes are coated with a fluor, which allows for the absorption and re-emission of, um, of light at a longer wavelength that we can see. Um, you'll still see it in some switches and thermometers because it's heavy and it's liquid and it'll, it'll sling down to the bottom of a little tube and make a, connector, a connection, electrical connection. That's how it works in thermostats. It's also used um, 
you guys know what the, the research submersible Alvin is, that the, um, the only manned submersible we've got? That's got a mercury ballast system, trim system. Um, that is to say, it, it pumps mercury from one part of the submarine to the other part of the submarine to be able to trim it out um, level underwater. And there's like 10 pounds of this stuff. I mean, that's enough to contaminate quite a bit of the ocean as well. Um, we still see it in paints today. Um, uh, beautiful colors can be made from it. And we also see it in um, fungicides. Um, and many of you are aware of the Minamata Bay disaster. You guys heard of that? Some of you, old, older farts still. Um, but in terms of um, it used as a fungicide, it's used um, to coat seeds so that the seeds don't rot in the soil, right? So it's a fungicide keeps a, keeps the seeds from rotting until they can germinate. And um, during the 70s, early 70s, um, particularly in Iran, and um, there was a huge famine, um, and people were starving to death. And so the U.S. as part of their U.S. aid program shipped over tons of um, wheat seed that was coated with this fungicide. And when you send tons of wheat seed to a starving community, are they going to plant it and wait six months to harvest? No, they grind it into flour and make bread out of it. And on the order of 10,000 people were contaminated with, uh, with mercury, and, and many of them died. It was one of the largest mercury poisonings uh, on record. Minamata Bay was the other one, and this was something that happened um, through the Chiso Chemical Company on, um, who had a chemical plant on the bay, Minamata Bay in Japan, and they were discharging methylmercury into the nearshore environment and, and the same place where people were fishing for, uh, for their own food. And uh, people started getting sick and weird and uh, there were all these problems coming up, birth defects, deformities, and, uh, and it was only discovered really when the cats in town that were feeding heavily on the fish were kind of uh, experiencing neuropathy and kind of stumbling down the streets and thought, well, let's we'll analyze one of those cats. And it was contaminated with mercury and thought, oh, interesting. And they traced it to the mercury plant of all places. And um, 15 years later, they shut down that discharge. 15 years. They knew it was the cat. They knew it was, it was it, and this was an example to me of um, government in support of industry at the expense of the population. So I'm just saying. <laughs> um, I'm saying that voting isn't enough. You can't just choose leaders and have them go off and do things. You have to be on their ass the whole time. I guess that's what I'm saying. <laughs> so um, it's also. Um, it's used sort of as a poison, so it's used as a rat poison, used as an insecticide, a disinfectant, and it's also used to preserve um, vaccination, vaccines. So this is, uh, th thimerosal is this mercury compound that's in, um, in vaccines, and um, you can see the mercury group right here. Now, mercury in your system is going to form irreversible chemical bonds, typically with cysteine and methionine residues, and so it'll deactivate enzymes. Um, and so that's, that can be bad news. This was thought to be responsible for um, autism in kids that were um, uh, vaccinated, big scare, about 10 years ago. And that has been debunked. Um, so it's not the mercury, not the thimerosal in the vaccines, but every time you do get a vaccination, you get like more than three weeks worth of mercury in, uh, as an adult into your system. So every time I go in for my flu shot, I tell them I'm pregnant and I want the kind without the uh, preservative in it. And, uh, and they, yeah, it works actually until this last, <laughs> until this last year, um, I went in there and said, well, you know, we only got out of I think about 10,000 vaccinations. Only 10 um, were the preservative-free type. So you should be thinking about that. Um, in terms of the sources to the environment, the chloralkali plants were some of the most uh, egregious uh, violators of the uh, EPA standards because they used to pump out lots of uh, 
water saturated with mercury into local waterways. That, the, the way we make, and this is a, 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 a plant that makes chlorine and um, sodium hydroxide, um, and which is important in terms of cement production or for plastics. Um, this is why plastics may be elevated in some um, mercury compounds because the chloralkali process was used to develop the, the chlorine um, for production of um, polychlorinated biphenyls and such. Um, it was also used um, in the hat uh, making business uh, as a mercuric nitrate, which um, uh, loosens the fur and makes it easy to scrape, uh, scrape hair off the beavers and stuff like that. So um, uh, the problem was that the people who were in the felting industry were coming into contact with this in a very intimate way. And, that's, uh, and because it has neurological effects, uh, the term mad hatter was, um, uh, was coined. Now today, the four top anthropogenic sources of mercury um, are um, sort of in this, um, in this order. Coal-fired power plants, um, municipal waste incineration, medical waste incineration, and hazardous waste combustion. Do you see a, do you see a um, pattern here? Anything, anything that makes heat is going to volatilize mercury, right? Okay, and, and one of the reasons coal-fired power plants are so bad is because mercury is often associated with some of the same deposits where you find coal. It's like these coastal regions here where um, uh, mercury can be scavenged out of the water column and, and form sulfide complexes with minerals. Um, and then when you dig that up and burn it off, you have, uh, you have uh, a tremendous source of mercury um, into the atmosphere. Um, so anything over 306 degrees Celsius. Can you think of another one? What about the Sobranes fire? One of the largest, most expensive wildfires uh, in the nation to date. Um, so yeah, these fires get to be over 360 degrees at ground level and probably volatilize all the mercury within the upper 10 centimeters or 20 centimeters of the, of the soil column. The other thing about that is this range, this mountain range here in the, um, um, in Los Padres National Forest and stuff are rich in serpentinite type deposits. These are the formations that um, where you find cinnabar. This is where all the mercury mines are located. So we have natural mercury occurring here. We all have also have within the Sobranes uh, fire region probably a hundred years of atmospheric deposition and accumulation in that soil. So when you volatilize it all in about a week or so, this plume is likely to be um, pretty mercury rich. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the contamination from gold mining. How many of you um, can, well, how many of you went to elementary school in California? All right. Remember fourth grade California history? Okay. You remember the discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill on the American River? Okay. Now that led to the massive amount of placer gold mining, which is the, um, uh, the harvesting of little tiny flakes from mud and rock deposits, uh, usually typically through um, hydraulic mining. And what they didn't say, what they didn't tell you in fourth grade California history was that um, millions and millions of pounds of mercury were mined in mercury mines in the coast range and carried to the Sierra foothills where it was used to form metal amalgams with the gold and extract it from, um, uh, from a slurry of mud. And this resulted in huge amounts of erosion through hydraulic mining practices. Um, this mining only lasted about, um, about 10 years before the government shut it down because it was so destructive and it was, it was starting to shoal um, navigational routes within San Francisco Bay. I mean, to this day, there are even gravels in uh, San Francisco Bay that are being mined uh, for aggregate reasons that originated from the Sierra foothills, okay? Trinity River filled up. This mountain used to be that tall, and that was all washed down into the river. Um, so it was, a, it was a big operation. I mean, people were going great guns with this technique led to the establishment of one of the largest mercury mines in California, which is at New Almaden. 
um, and uh, New Idria. Um, so I think Ivano has taken students there uh, for field trips. But uh, this was a piece of our history that is um, not, um, that we're still feeling the results of today. Um, and lucky for the geochemists. So uh, this was the production in terms of thousands of flasks through 1850, peak of the gold rush, dies back off. If you take a look at um, glacial records of atmospheric deposition, it looks like this. These are, the, um, these are peaks in mercury. This is sort of the pre-industrial background amount. Here's the Mount St. Helens eru eruption. Uh, this is the Industrial Revolution sort of kind of creeping up through here. World War II manufacturing, mercury nitrates were used as, um, as triggers for many um, ordinances. Uh, Krakatoa, Gold Rush, um, uh, other, um, other eruptions. Anything that makes heat, okay, explosions, uh, fires, um, per combustion of uh, coal um, and volcanoes. Some of the um, indicator, indicators um, of sublethal mercury poisoning are reduced hand-eye coordination, um, reduced learning ability, reduced ability to recall names, reduced ability to copy names and objects. Does this sound like anybody you know? <laughs> Dustin, yeah, maybe a little chelation therapy would be good for you. Shaky hands, cerebral palsy. I mean, because it's a neurotoxin, it affects sort of the long nerve trains, um, and so it can develop symptoms similar to other, um, um, other neurological problems. Now, when you think about it, um, in nature, any process that makes you stupid is going to kill you. And, um, and what I mean by that is it doesn't have to be a lethal dose to kill you. If it just inhibits your ability to turn left onto Highway 1, you know, or to reduce your ability to forage or get away from a predator, it's going to be lethal, even at a sublethal dose. So I'm, I'm thinking that there is no physiological use for mercury in our bodies, and there is no real safe level. The, the standards for human consumption are based on sort of 0.3 parts per million. That's the FDA um, standard. But 0.3 parts per million, as you're going to see, is quite a lot. So. I'm getting to fog. Don't worry about that. Um, our, hit, our lab has a history of this. It started out with um, John Martin, George Nauer. Uh, graduate students jumped into this. A graduate student by the name Mark Stevenson jumped into this and sort of uh, started up the uh, State Muscle Watch program. That was a program used to look at um, uh, metal contamination levels in muscles statewide as a sort of bioindicator. And then um, Wes Heim, Amy Byington, um, you know, Steve, Autumn, you know, all the guys from the um, uh, Marine Pollution Studies Lab um, have done a tremendous job sort of advancing Moss Landing Marine Laboratories as being sort of a, a, a world expert in mercury analysis. Um, and this is part of uh, uh, part of Wes's thesis was at, in, in support of the CalFed project. This was a federal state initiative to look at how come fish uh, have so much mercury in, in, mercury in them in the Bay Delta complex. That is, um, this, is a, this is a San Joaquin, Sacramento Bay Delta complex is a, is a watershed that's managed mostly um, for the survival of largemouth bass, and salmon, right? And how come they are so high? Well, Wes's thesis was about creating a GIS map of where in the delta this uh, methylation was occurring and what we could do about it. And when you divide um, the flux, uh, divide the inventory uh, in the sediments of all the mercury by the flux of mercury out, you get a residence time. And the residence time for mercury in the Bay Delta complex is 5,000 years, OK? So for the period over which we were mining gold, and gold was uh, you know, uh, boosting the economy of California, let's say 10 years, took us to make a 5,000-year problem. 
Amy's thesis was about putting together a budget uh, for mercury cycling in the, day, in the Bay Delta complex and see what the major loss terms, what the major source terms were. And she was the one who identified photodemethylation um, as a primary loss term for the Bay Delta complex. Um, really some striking findings since then. Many students have um, gone through that lab, but what it did for us is it really established our laboratory as uh, sort of a world experts on these types of analyses and made it possible for us to apply for an NSF grant to do wacky stuff. Um, and by that I mean um, let's, take, let's take our science out of the applied and into sort of the um, the pure science and see if we can solve some problems or um, at least understand the cycling of mercury in a way that we, we hadn't before. So this is my transition into fog and I want to talk about the last sort of three years of NSF funding that we've, uh, that we've had. Now this is sort of predicated upon uh, a unique finding and that finding was um, so uh, it was collaborative uh, between the UC Santa Cruz and the Marine Pollution Studies Laboratory in which um, working with Peter Weiss um, and uh, some other Moss Landing, ex Moss Landing people, um, there's Wes, uh, found that um, monomethyl mercury, that neurotoxic form, um, was like 10 to 100 times more concentrated in fog water than in rainwater. It's like, what? You know, why is that? And, um, and does that, make a, does that make any sense? Well, you take a look at, this is from Rituba, USGS has been kind of looking at mercury from a total mercury perspective. And they looked at redwood tree leaves, and this is redwood tree leaves, it's kilometers from the coast, so this is right on the coast. Um, young leaves, old leaves, they're high, right near the coast, and they drop off quickly as you go inland. So what is it, wait, wait a second, what about the redwood trees? Well, redwood trees, are one of those habitats that require fog to function, um, you know, optimally. So do maritime chaparral complexes. We live in a maritime chaparral complex. Um, uh, uh, the majority of, uh, of water that it gets is from fog, particularly from the months April through um, November, okay? That's where most of the water's coming from. So you look at this transect and you think, wow, well, what's happening there? Well. Um, Peter sort of uh, engaged his uh, citizen science, flexed his citizen science muscles and engaged some fourth graders. Now fourth graders are really good at catching wolf spiders and um, you can just give them a jar and tell them how to catch them and you can set them out on transects. And what we found with, uh, with the wolf spider is that um, wolf spiders had concentrations of mercury in them um, that were hundred times what the concentrations were in wolf spiders from non-foggy areas. So foggy wolf spiders are contaminated, but not foggy wolf spiders um, uh, are not contaminated. And by the way, these, uh, these spiders uh, in foggy regions exceed like one uh, to five parts per million, way above the FDA standard for human consumption. So if you're having any ideas about eating these spiders, I'd say, um, don't do that. But uh, again, the reason we targeted wolf spiders was because they're top predators. And the, any mercury contamination would be amplified um, up the food chain. And, um, and you think about t terrestrial food chains, you think, well, we're going to think about grass and deer and mountain lions in a second. But um, when you're thinking about wolf spiders, you're really thinking about fog water to bacteria to protozoa, to ciliates, to planaria, to nematodes, to centipedes, to small spiders and wolf spiders. Okay, that's a factor of 10 to the 12th amplification um, in, those, in those food safety. So even though, th though these are small organisms, they can represent uh, extreme rates of bioaccumulation. So we kind of put all this together. We thought, something's happening here, but we don't know what it is. So, that's really hard to write an NSF proposal um, based on that uh, sort of uh, search criteria. Um, but we think we can figure it out. And so we submitted a proposal, joint collaborative proposal with, uh, we had atmospheric chemists from UC Santa Cruz. We had um, oceanographers, Moss Landing Marine Labs. We had fog people. 
Um, and it went in there and it was denied. And we thought, damn. But we got some good, re good reviews. So, you know, when you get some good reviews, uh, even if you're rejected, you go back at it. And so we went back at it and we put together this proposal that was more like a Sherlock Holmes mystery than it was um, anything else. You know, we had some of these observations. We put together this idea. It's coming from marine advective fog. This is fog that forms over the ocean, that vex inland. There's got to be a marine connection here, and we're going to find out what it is. And this time they bought it, and they funded us for three years, two years of cruises, four separate cruises, two on the Point Sur, one on the Sproul, and one on the Oceanus. And these, you know, from Ventura up to Newport, Oregon, are, are the stations that we occupied. These little triangles uh, here on the land are where we had um, an array of fog uh, collectors, terrestrial fog collectors. So we're measuring fog on land and then we're measuring fog at sea, and then we're probing the depths of the ocean to figure out um, where this might be happening. Now, if you take a look at what we know about the uh, cycling of mercury, the dominant paradigm is mercury comes off the land or in via the atmosphere, and it's methylated by sulfate-reducing bacteria in oxygen minimum areas or regions on the shelf. That's the dominant paradigm, okay? So we thought, okay. That's, that's like, those are some of the usual suspects, you know. Sherlock on the team are going to go shake down the usual suspects and uh, see if we can reproduce this conceptual um, uh, diagram. And so, um, so what we did was we looked at the water column, we looked at phytoplankton, zooplankton, sediments, the microlayer, we looked at marine snow particles, we did cobalt incubations because vitamin B12 cobalamin is essential for the methylation reaction in bacteria. We uh, incubated sediments, we sampled fog, we looked at cyclonic and anticyclonic eddies, and I'm going to get to that in just a second. Um, we, um, we specifically targeted uh, not just plankton but necton, those plankton that float at the very surface. And so um, the idea was to sample all the compartments, the, bi the biotic compartments and the abiotic compartments. <clears throat> we did all the gas phase analysis. I use that term loosely. I didn't do one gas phase analysis on that trip. <laughs> Raise your hand if you did some gas phase analyses on that trip. <laughs> yeah, all right. Autumn, yeah. Holly, Alex, yeah. And then, um, and then the, uh, some of the stable compounds in the solid phases were analyzed back in the lab. We also jumped over the side of the ship, and this is important in terms of developing um, sort of a sense of the natural history of the uh, epipelagic water column. It helps you uh, understand what sort of processes may be responsible for um, conversion. Where, where can you get, where can you get like sulfate reducing bacteria to thrive in an oxygenated water column, right? Um, but sometimes if you jump over the side of the ship, you can go, oh, it might be in the gut of this organism, might be in this organic um, uh, aggregate. And then we followed um, uh, these mesoscale eddies. Now, this is a bunch of maps. These are maps of the California coast uh, on the 15th of, uh, or the 11th of August, 12th, blah, blah, blah. What you can see is that these mesoscale eddies are relatively constant features. Um, and the blue represent um, upwelling eddies, and the red represent uh, downwelling eddies. And, um, and so I'm going to sort of show you in more detail what this looks like. Um, the cyclonic eddies are spinning counterclockwise, okay? Um, and, and, they, um, and so they're, therefore they um, create upwelling. The downwelling eddies spin counterclockwise, okay, downwelling eddies. And so what we can do is tactically choose um, downwelling locations and upwelling locations. Downwelling, upwelling, downwelling, it's weakly downwelling, weakly upwelling, strongly downwelling. You get it? Now,
I got a way of demonstrating this, and I'm going to have to um, enlist the help of faculty um, to uh, help me with this demonstration. So can the faculty come over to this clear area right here? I see you two over there. Come on up here. Come on. Yep, yep, that's you. That's you. Come on, Tom. Jim. Okay. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna lead you in the. Um, the yeah, the chair, the chair, and the and the director, the chair and the director. This is okay. You're gonna be okay because whereas you guys are gonna do the dance, you guys are gonna do the song. <laughs> okay. Now, this is gonna be the, to the tune of Pop Goes the Weasel. Okay. Circling with the eddies, the water moves round and round on a spinning planet. It goes up or it goes down. So I want you guys to come in a circle here. I'm serious. Okay, now, now we're going to be a cyclonic eddy. That means you're going to turn to the right. Okay, no, no, you, we're not, we don't have to hold hands anymore. This is okay. We're just turning, we're just turning to the right. Now, so you're going to, so you're going to be looking, you're going to be looking at the person in front of you. You guys got the song ready to go? No. Circling with the eddies, the water moves round and round <laughs> on a spinning planet. It goes up or it goes down. <laughs> Full. <laughs> okay, are you ready? Are you ready for now? Now, what our job is is we're circling until we get to on a spinning planet. And then we're going to exert the Coriolis effect. Okay, ready? And then, and then we're going to move in the direction. And in the northern hemisphere, we're going to move to the right. Are you ready? Okay, ready? Circling with the eddies, the water moves round and round. On a spinning plan, it goes up or it goes down. You guys didn't deflect. <laughs> Do this again. I want some real deflection around here. In fact, okay. Pick it up a little bit. Ready? <laughs> we have to deflect to the right. Water moves round and round. On a spinning planet. Yes. You see what happened there? That was called divergence. Okay? So in, in regions of cyclonic eddies, you get divergence. The water moves. Water parcels move away like this. You get upwelling of deep waters in order to replace that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> All right, now we're gonna do we're gonna do a anti-cyclonic eddy, and we're still in the northern hemisphere. So I want you to turn to your left, and when you deflect, you're gonna go which direction? Right. Always to the right. Ready? Hit it! <laughs> deflect. Yes. Yes. So. So I want to review. You guys were great. So I want, I want to review, because this is an important uh, phenomena that we're checking out here. In cyclonic eddies, you get upwelling. You also get a divergence. This is a region that concentrates sinking material, whereas in um, anticyclonic eddies, upwelling, well, downwelling, that's a, that's a region of convergence. Floating things will concentrate in regions of downwelling. Sinking things will concentrate in regions of upwelling. That wasn't too bad, was it, Tom? <laughs> it was just the song part. <laughs> yes. Okay. So. Okay. So if so, this is the this is the emerging paradigm that I want to talk about in cyclonic eddies, upwelling. Um, we did some profiles um, with the CTD looking at the concentration of dimethylmercury. This is a gaseous phase, and in um, Anticyclonic eddies, downwelling eddies, it's constant, um, low values. There's no gradient in uh, dimethylmercury, and then it starts to increase. Both have a maximum around 300 meters. But look at the shoaling of the dimethylmercury in the upwelling eddy. It's shoaled up about um, 50 to 100 meters relative to these other. Uh, so this is upwelling, downwelling. And if you take a look at um, these. Um, these profiles in a little more detail. You can see strong gradients here, no gradients here. If you can apply a, a vertical eddy diffusivity coefficient to this gradient, you can calculate a flux. 
And so that's what we did. Flux is equal to Kz times the gradient in dimethylmercury with respect to depth. And um, we used a sort of a average vanilla vertical, vertical eddy diffusivity coefficient um, and measured this gradient from this profile. And that gradient was about 237 picomolar. And then we measured this depth gradient, and that was about 186, and we can calculate from that a flux of 11 picomoles per square meter per day. You with me? All right. And so this is kind of, this is a, um, and this integrates. This in, um, you can do instantaneous measurements of, or calculations using Henry's law constant for the flux of gas into the lower troposphere, but this integrates all process, the oceanographic processes and instantaneous conditions, winds, and everything. So this compares to literature values of 0.2 to 0.4. We win. We have a throbbing flux of dimethylmercury um, in this coastal zone. So the way that fits into our developing conceptual model of mercury cycling is this. It's to particularly in upwelling regions, and I'm not going to restrict it to um, cyclonic eddies, but in regular old Ekman uh, wind-driven upwelling, you're going to get the flux of uh, the shoaling of these um, picnoclines and the evasion of dimethylmercury into the atmosphere. Remember, dimethylmercury is a gas. So this is how dimethylmercury gets into, into the lower troposphere. And then, well, what? That's not the observation. The observation is it's monomethylmercury, the other neurotoxin that's in fog. And what happens there? Well, um, Watson. Um, can you explain this? And we thought, well, um, if you think about, if Sherlock thinks about this, and you think, well, what's happening in the lower troposphere? Well, this is, this is a region of the, uh, of the atmosphere that's also concentrating and reacting with the sulfur cycle, marine sulfur cycle. And so this is a diagram of um, the marine sulfur cycle. Um, that is on a, this is, consider this to be, uh, here we, we're thinking about, about it being um, a terrestrial aerosol particle, a piece of dust, piece of dust. And then from the marine sulfur cycle, DMS evades, photooxidized to sulfuric acid that coats this particle and actually dissolves it on its way back down. So these coatings around aerosol particles, and I'm talking about particles that are about two microns in diameter, okay, fairly small, but they can have coatings of relatively low pH. Some of those pHs have been measured to be typically one, two uh, pH units. London fog was an example of an extremely acidic fog event. Some of these aerosol particles can have two molar sulfuric acid coatings on these. So could that affect the conversion of um, dimethylmercury into monomethylmercury? So we do an experiment. In fact, we did three. Just got the results two days ago, which is <laughs> awesome because it fit uh, it fit this. It was um, it was this experiment right in the middle. So the, the idea is, um, you take up, you, you look at the rubber book. These are the um, the CRC, or it, you look for thermodynamic rate uh, or stability constants with respect to this reaction, and it's fairly strongly favors this species, right? But how does that happen? Well, I was looking at this reaction. I'm thinking, well, it involves a proton here with a generation of methane here, let's do an acidification experiment. Let's, see, well, let's try and make uh, acidic aerosol particle. And so uh, we did uh, three experiments. Um, this is initial concentration. This is final at pH 1.7, pH 3.5, and pH 5.2, okay? But we had to incubate them for different periods of time, six hours, 12 hours, and 48 hours. And you see that when you plot this up, you can plot the pseudo first order uh, rate constant for acidolysis. This is the demethylation rate constant here, and it's fast, 2.2 2 .2 per day, or 2.2, yeah, 2.2 .2 per day um, at pH um, 1.7, you know? And the reason I'm, we're doing these short incubations is we want to know whether this reaction is consistent with the formation time period of fog. fog forms at night, you know, and it dissipates in the day. So whatever's, whatever's happening has got to happen pretty damn fast. And it looks like um, these results are consistent with um, the ability of the lower troposphere to absorb that 
throbbing flux of dimethylmercury and acidify it into dim or monomethylmercury in the fog. Okay? So our conceptual model is sort of developing here. Now let's take, a, let's take a look at some other processes. On some of the original cruises, we were purposefully looking at just the surface of the ocean, um, purposefully trying to collect um, water at the surface. And we saw, you know, we saw fair enrichment there, and we thought, hey, wait a second. Maybe it's the microlayer that's helping to accumulate the monomethyl mercury into that thin film. You guys know about the microlayer? Microlayer is a region of around 40 microns thick that covers the surface of the ocean, 10 to 40 microns. The, the width of a hair, this is where all oil slicks concentrate, right? This is where hydrophobic compounds and uh, uh, polysaccharides and crap like that. What if the, the, the monomethyl mercury is partitioning into that microlayer? Then every time a bubble would break, you'd generate aerosols that are rich in. Um, uh, so Alex, Alex Watson was the guy who uh, was, to, was looking at this, and he saw some enrichment factors that are pretty substantial. These are, these are much higher than, uh, than most other trace metals, uh, uh, this enrichment factor. So it kind of helps to um, suggest that this is, um, is an appropriate mechanism. But I think when we collect those, we're also diluting with some underlying water. So the next step is to be able to capture just these aerosol particles. And this is what Alex is working on now. Young Watson um, has built a little, um, what should we call it? A, don't use any bad words here. Let's see. <coughs> um, a floating sucking machine, yeah. <laughs> And uh, we're trying to capture those aerosols onto this uh, uh, that result from bubble breaking. So the other, the other thing that came to us during the last AGU meeting was, um, not the last one, one before, is um, um, we were in this mercury session. It's like, OK, Mr. Iron goes to the mercury session. And all the mercury people come up to me, me and say, OK, smarty pants, can you tell me where this methylmercury is being produced? And um, they didn't actually say smarty pants. They said, uh, Kenneth. <laughs> and I said, why? No, Cindy, you're Miss Methylation. You should tell me where the methylation is being produced, or methyl species are being produced. And she said, I think it's in, and the, here comes the paradigm, right? I think it's in the reducing sediments of, uh, of the continental margins, I said. Oh, Cindy, those are at, uh, the shelf breaks at 100 meters, and we have a we have a maximum at 300 meters. And she goes, rats, foiled. I know, it's in the oxygen minimum. Remember the other paradigm? Um, and I said, oh well, Cindy, the oxygen minimum off California is at 800 meters. And she says, rats. Well, she said, damn it, you tell me where the um, where the dimethyl, the methylation is occurring. And I said, Cindy, this is where fecal pellets go to die. And, um, and so then quick, like a bunny rabbit, you got to get another Watson onto that because pretty, pretty soon they're going to publish that result. In, in, uh, in, and so this is where uh, Holly Watson is uh, investigating the um, the source of the monomethyl and dimethyl mercury max at that depth. We also did take a look at shelf sediments. Um, and by taking slow entry box scores, we extracted pore waters. And you can, using a molecular diffusion approach, um, calculate a benthic flux in picomoles per meter squared per day. Re remember our uh, eddy flux, 11 picomoles. The, um, the shelf sediments don't appear to be a strong source, so we can sort of rule that out. Um, but what is producing this? And so what we're looking at is, or what Holly's looking at, is the role that the biological pump plays in perhaps um, capturing um, organic matter in the form of um, either present or formerly uh, phytoplankton. It's packaging into marine snow particles and fecal pellets. And it's sinking through the water column. Um, and this is a, a plot of, from Martin et al. 
Uh, this is a plot of the flux of particulate organic carbon through the, uh, through, through the water column. You can see that it's, it's very high at 100 meters and falls off very rapidly with the most rapid rate of change near, near 300 meters. And so the idea is as what this represents, the derivative of this function represents the dissolution of that sinking material, right? And so it's concomitant with that, and we'll just call it stinking material, um, because I think within it, uh, you can, uh, are particles like this that can develop strong oxygen minima and provide microenvironments um, that can support sulfate reduction and likely methylation of mercury species right under our noses in a totally oxygenated water column, but um, carrying out an, a, a, um, an anoctic process. So we're going to be looking at that. And the other reason that gives us some, um, uh, some reason to believe that this is important is this is a, this is a year record of um, dimethylmercury uh, uh, that is sampled from our seawater intakes, and we show High, high concentrations of dimethyl mercury uh, associated with upwelling favorable conditions and then dropping down, and then we think it's coming back up. So it's, there seems to be a linkage. Now I'm going to talk a little about fog. Um, we also collected uh, fog at sea, okay, uh, through these active strand fog collectors mounted on the bow of the research vessels. Um, and we collected fog at land on all these, at all these sites. And when you take a look at the, um, this, um, the hypothesis here is that dimethylmercury comes up into the atmosphere, is uh, um, cleaved at, by acid cleavage to monomethylmercury. Therefore, um, the oldest fog should have the most um, monomethylmercury in it. And so if you... Um, it, and it, it works because fog is close to the source and it's also close to the mechanism. And so if you take a look at monomethylmercury and fog, and this is distance to sea, you can see it's relatively, this is a log scale here, so watch it. Um, it's relatively low, gets really high near the coast, and then it drops off inland. And if you plot it on a um, linear scale, this is open ocean fog coming to the coast, getting really big, and then dropping off inland. Wow. That really speaks to being a coastal source of monomethylmercury to the fog. So we're looking and starting to hone in on, you know, what would that, what would that be? Well, our, our, our paradigm is that perhaps monomethylmercury is coming not just from um, uh, upwelling, um, but also from sea spray, um, from microlayer. Um, and, um, and how could you test this? The, the, uh, the emerging hypothesis is that fog has more methylmercury in it than rain because fog forms at the sea surface, which is close to the upwelling source and the acidic method, method for um, demethylation, whereas rainwater forms thousands of feet above that, separated from the source. So how would you test that as an oceanographer? Well, damn it, you need to turn it upside down, and we need to get a platform that we can use to do a vertical profile in, in the sky. And so, so we were able to get some time on the Surpass aircraft. This lives in Marina, uh, fitted it with a fog, um, a cloud droplet collector, and piggybacked on um, some transects from University of Arizona. And what would you expect? You'd expect that over cold, surfaces where there's more upwelling that you get higher values of monomethyl mercury and fog and at higher temperatures you get lower values. Now this is kind of messy but this is exactly what we're seeing. Uh, high temperatures, low values, low temperatures, high values. So it's consistent with this developing model and then uh, in, in terms of altitude, you'd, you'd suggest that at higher altitude, you'd have lower concentrations, and lower altitude, you'd have higher concentrations. So the aircraft observations are consistent with this story. So let's go, t let's take another look at this. Uh, so we do have, we can, th we think we can explain the mechanism by which methylmercury is produced in fog, but what effect is it having 
on the watershed. And this is where we're now working with, um, our group is working with Chris Wilmers at uh, the Puma Project and um, looking at trophic um, interactions. Um, and he's actually looking at mountain lion whiskers. The idea is that um, fog has a certain amount of flux in, uh, on the watershed. And this is the monomethyl mercury in fog and in rainwater, fog and rainwater. So in foggy areas, we get more mercury flux. And we're looking at puma whiskers from foggy areas and non-foggy areas. I mean, there's a real strange uh, linear relationship between whiskers and fur, uh, mercury and whiskers and fur. So if we pluck a whisker, this is like, this turned into a roadkill project, right? OK, so um, we see strong correlations there. And you see that um, these are non-foggy areas, foggy areas. In foggy areas, the mountain lines are loaded relative to non-foggy areas. And so we think we have we're able to explain um, a mechanism by which this anthropogenic contaminant is coming from the sea to the and uh, most of the times we think about that contamination running the other way, right? From land to sea. But here's an example where it's actually coming back at us. You know, anthropogenic fluxes have increased mercury deposition rates by a factor of five since pre-industrial. And now we have a watershed to amplify that. So um, don't be eating any mountain lions either, OK? And, um, uh, so what, what we're at now is we're putting together another NSF proposal and, uh, and a publication for deep sea research. And um, I'd be happy to take any questions. <laughs> yeah, Jim. So um, a lot of the biological effects you're talking about are sort of cumulative over a long period of time. Yes. So I'm kind of interested in the seasonal changes. And most of the, the measurements you made in fog and everything else was done during a period where we had a lot less upwelling generally than, yeah. than typical years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I was wondering whether on a typical year where you have a lot of, like, well, you look at variation in upwelling, yep. you, you would suspect if the methylation was occurring methylization is occurring at, at 200 meters or 300 meters of where the particles are you know, going. That if you had a lot of upwelling, all of that's being flushed offshore, and you you get less mercury in the in the methyl mercury in the fog during really strong events, years where there's lots of upwelling. Whereas if you get a typical one where it's sloshing back and forth, yeah. you might get more. Do you, well, I, you know, this is sort of a one. With it, what you're about? Uh, it's kind of a one-dimensional um, model that we're talking about here, and it seems like the character of the uh, of the methylated profiles are very consistent, sort of wherever you go. So what it means is, in deep water, and um, and particularly water at around 100 meters, there is a big inventory of dimethyl mercury. So if you get an upwelling event, you can it probably takes several to you know like, as I think you're saying, flush out that um, that dimethyl mercury. So I don't know if you I don't know on what timescales you'd see this. I think what we'd need to do is see if the profiles change over time. Problem with fog is it's, it's fickle. You know, it's only here from maybe June till August, um, and um, and our ability to collect it is somewhat stochastic. So, so. If you went to another upwelling zone, yeah, um, would you see the sort of same effects given the fact of how much mercury we've added to? System right. Here. So the mercury that we see, um, the mercury that falls into the ocean is globally distributed. Basically, it's a, it's a tropospheric phenomena. So the anthropogenic mercury, unless you're downwind of a power plant, um, is going to be pretty much the same. For the next three years of NSF funding, we are collaborating with Chilean colleagues and putting in fog samplers in the southern hemisphere to see if our results are extrapolatable uh, to the ocean, ocean scale. So I, that's a crappy answer to your question. But it's kind of the best I can do right now. Um, we're, we're hoping to make a stronger watershed connection. This has gotten a tremendous amount of public attention. Um, and so we got, well, I don't know. Most, most of the fog people, if you know any fog, anyone, any fog people in here? 
okay, most of the fog people are like airport people, you know. They're, they're all about how often are the airports going to get shut down because, like, you shut down San Francisco because of air, you know, because of fog, and that's millions of dollars a day. And so they like to develop, they're all about developing models of, uh, of fog uh, occurrence. And then the other fog people are all, ab all about deposition to the watershed. How much water, and can we use fog water to uh, supplement our water supply or make vodka out of? Has anyone had that vodka from um, Randall Graham that's made out of fog water? You don't know what I'm talking about? <laughs> No, it's like 160 bucks a bottle, and I'm thinking that at that price, it's pro it's it's cheaper than what we're doing. You know, we should just buy that stuff. <laughs> we just wanted to. I know we should we should uh, we should let them know. We should certify it. Well, you know, only six nanograms per liter. We want to get back into the ocean and, um, and investigate the process that responsible for the methylation itself. So part of this NSF project is to use the Martin, use the Sheila B, construct some sediment traps, throw them out there, see what we can me measure, and also measure the metagenomics in that particular organic material. So see if there are genes present that, that code for methylation of mercury and also identify the fluxing fractions. That is to say, is it pr primarily fecal pellet dominated? What organisms are responsible? Um, can, we, um, can we pin this on uh, one of the usual suspects, like euphausids or salps or something like that? Um, there seems to be a strong correlation with upwelling, um, but that's, that's just, all upwelling does, well, it does two things. It ventilates the upper water column, but also it fuels the biological pump, makes organic matter, both of which are important in terms of dimethyl evasion, but also methylation of mercury in deeper water. Well, I think you want to follow up? Yeah. So who's doing the measurements? Is that Moss doing the measurements? Yeah, I got to talk to Colleen about that. <laughs> yeah, but she's coming back the 22nd or something. Is she reachable by email? <laughs> yeah, I better get that email going pretty soon. <laughs> uh, but there's a lot you can use, learn just by looking at the material and then measuring the oxygen tension from the outside of the aggregate or fecal pellet particle into the inside. Um, so if we're making anoxic particles, there's a good chance we're promoting anoxic biochemistry. What can happen if people are suited after? You know, that's interesting. We have a collaboration with the Santa Cruz Municipal Utilities District where they have afforded us a little port on their methane generators. They, they make, um, they ferment their sewage and, um, into methane and, um, and then use the methane to power generators and run their plant. Well, if you got a methane generator, um, it's likely methylating not just organic carbon, but mercury species as well. And we've measured mercury in those gases in the sewer treatment plant, and they are screaming with respect to methyl mercury. So that's going to be very useful for us. We can use that gas to do experiments at higher level. Now, if you're talking about you know, ejecting that um, uh, sewer, um, basically, I would say if it hasn't undergone um, some digestion, anaerobic digestion, and it's just being discharged as primary sewage or something, you're going to have a problem. You're going to have a big problem. And there will, there will be a stronger peak um, in methylated species at depth. So, but I'd say it's, it makes a lot of sense to um, um, digest it at the sewer treatment facility, use the gas, burn that um, uh, so we don't put out so much methane into the atmosphere. Yeah, Justin. So you mentioned wolf spiders and pumas, so that's like half my diet. I don't know where to go from there. <laughs> um, is it, I mean, I'm assuming that this is happening to a bunch of different things, kind of like coastal, coastal regions. Is it just safe for me to be like, I'm not going to eat anything that's like coastal? Or, I mean, is there okay. work being done? I mean, rule of, uh, there is a, there is a 
physician from um, Pacific Grove called me because he's finding um, a huge number of patients coming into him with symptoms of mercury poisoning. And he was wondering if it was the fog. And because he's been, and I said, no, your patients are probably eating a lot of fish. And he said, yeah, they are. There's like, I said, well, how many, how many, how many, you know, meals a day? Well, some like uh, five, five meals a week, you know, six meals a week. I said, man, it's, it's the fish. Okay. So I'd say rule of thumb, don't eat anything from the Bay Delta complex. You know, largemouth bass is one of the worst. It's an ambush predator. You know, it, uh, um, anything high on the trophic level, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to say that uh, tilapia looks pretty good, you know, from a, from a mercury perspective, and, um, uh, and so does salmon, you know. So shorter food chains, younger fish is what you got to go for. And then don't worry about the fog. I'd say enjoy the fog, marvel in the fog. <laughs> All right, that it? All right, thanks very much. <laughs>